So we founded in 1997, and now we have offices all across the country, including here in Oregon. And uh, this is Ray Hackey, Attorney Ray Hackey. Uh, first service, I'll let you know what I, his nickname is, uh, the Bulldog, uh, because uh, we can put him somewhere in a case, and he will be not, int not intimidated, not distracted, and just do a, a focused, incredible job, and uh, just has a great, great track record of litigation, and we're just so glad that he's here in our, our Oregon office um, for, for good reason. So go ahead, and, what do you want to say? Well, as Brad said, my name's Ray Hackey. Uh, I'm... I live in the Salem area, that's where our office is. Uh, you know, it's kind of, we, we chose that area, not only because, you know, like the state's highest courts are there, the uh, Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court, but, you know, we can get to anywhere in the Portland area within like an hour, because that's, we know that there's a lot of stuff happening there. We can also get to the southern part of the state uh, within a reasonable time. Uh, we've got a couple of clients down there. Um, you know, there's a group that's in the Grants Pass area. They're called Abolish Abortion Oregon. Uh, you know, they like to preach outside of uh, Planned Parenthood down there, and they keep having trouble with the police. Uh, imagine that. Uh, apparently, they're preaching too loud, or people are upset by it. And so, basically, we're challenging the Constitution, the, we're challenging uh, the local noise ordinance on its face because basically it's all based on whether somebody is bothered or disturbed by it. You know, and so, you know, people don't, you know, earlier when Brad was talking about um, evangelism and that sort of thing and people turning away, well, guess what? The Bible convicts people. It stirs people. It bothers them. It, uh, they don't like to hear necessarily. They don't want, they want their ears tickled. And unfortunately, and, some of the, and sometimes the things that they say, you know, make people kind of shrink away. Uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> it's like, like the case in... Uh, it's similar to what we're dealing with up in Washington and state, uh, Seattle, mm -hmm. where the, uh, the BLM, Antifa are occupying the park. You guys know all about that. You guys have your occupiers in Portland and uh, riders and stuff. Well, they're, they're there, and a man comes out to preach the gospel, and he has a sign, very controversial sign. It says, um, only Jesus saves. It's like, okay, what's wrong with that, right? Um, that's what Jesus said, you know. So um, only Jesus saves, and he's preaching the gospel, not politics, anything. And they come and they rush him, and they beat him up. Mm -hmm. He's bleeding, just brutal with hatred for the gospel. And then the police finally show up. And the police, he thinks, okay, the police are going to protect me and arrest these people for a grotesque assault of battery. No, they arrest him for disturbing the peace. And he's being prosecuted, so we're representing him. Mm. And so those are the kind of cases, those kind of things we see here in Oregon too, right? Yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, another one of my clients, we actually won a settlement in this case. Uh, he, uh, he, he wasn't even necessarily preaching. He was just standing in, the, in uh, Waterfront Park, uh, holding an anti-abortion sign, passing out tracts, and all of a sudden he gets a citation from an, from an officer, basically saying he's harassing people. Okay, uh, and so he, he wasn't doing anything. He has the right of free speech. Either we have free speech or we don't. Either we have freedom of religion or we don't. I'll, tell, I'll share something with you. The verse that kind of confirmed my calling to be a lawyer is Psalm 11.3. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Religious freedom is a foundation on which this country is built. And there are people in power who are trying to erode that foundation. Well... All I got to say is, not on the Bulldog's watch. Amen. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's interesting, also a little about Ray. Um, he interned with us for how many years? Was three and a half. Three and a half years he interned with us while, while in law school. He's in a four-year program, I think, and at McGeorge. And then he went and worked. And because we want people working for us full-time, generally, that are, that are seasoned and have experience. Uh, because they're, you know, often on, on by themselves in offices and doing things. And so it's about six years went by, I think it was. It was about six years. So, something like something like that. And we had a, a position yeah. open up. And we so arranged for, for me to interview him. He, he was in the, the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. And I was 45 minutes late. Really bad. Because I got lost in the GPS. Okay, that's my excuse. But it, it was, seriously, I went the wrong whatever street in the wrong town and anyway mm -hmm. finally got there and I met with him I said I am so sorry I'm so late I says and he said um, 
And then remember what you said? He said, I've been waiting six years for this interview. I could wait another 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, um, anyways, of course, I really wanted the job. So, <laughs> yeah, he just so that was, and we we're just so pleased uh, that he is uh, he's here as a part of our team. We have a very unique uh, a bunch on our team of attorneys in different different offices, different uh, strengths, uh, different connections, and um, it's just a, a real blessing to be able to to have that. Another person, the one who hit up our New York office, she entered with uh, interned with us 20 years ago, and then she went to New York. You know, and then she hears of the position, and she opened up our office there in uh, New York, and uh, it's been just fantastic. God, in the meantime, had networked her with uh, many in the church and ministry com community, and so it's just how God works is just, it's so incredible. Um, and then the, in Washington State, the gentleman who opened up that office, um, he was, uh, is interesting, um, Jorge Ramos, he, uh, he was a non-believer. And we were defending a street preacher there uh, who was being prosecuted up there because he was preaching at the courthouse steps, a street preacher, and he'd be preaching and preaching. And attorneys, of course, who are proud and know everything, would just, you know, just <laughs> whatever, you know. Just go, well, that's how Jorge Ramos was, except one day that preacher is preaching and he's walking and the Holy Spirit hit him with something and he turned and he listened and he gave his life to Christ. And while he's being discipleshipped, in, in discipleship, they said, you know, the Pacific Justice is looking for an attorney to, to defend us. Um, and so God literally just plucked, I mean, just, I mean, it's just so exciting how God mm -hmm. works. So then we have the attorney who came to Christ by the guy that was, we were defending the opportunity to minister. And then he was defending him. And then he was doing outside ministry, outside evangelism. And uh, now he's, he's back, we have another attorney but he's still working with us. But it's just how God in his work, his hand works is just so encouraging. It was another case. Tell us about the one about the business owner, the Dahl case, the Dahl construction. All right. Well, Joel Dahl, uh, he, he, you've all heard that uh, hymn. It says, you know, we're the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Joel Dahl was the vilest offender. He was a real hard case. The cops wrote him off and everything. Uh, and, but he came to Christ while in prison. And, you know, now that he's out, you know, he's actually formed a construction company where that hires ex-cons like him. Uh, and, you know, and these are people who, you know, as you might imagine, have a hard time finding employment once they get out of prison or jail or, you know, incarceration. And so basically, but he doesn't just want to give them employment. He wants to help them find the path of righteousness. And so one of the things that he does is he has, a, he, a, he requires them to attend Bible study. Uh, and so, um, and a lot of them are fine with it. In, f in fact, that's actually part of his brand. It's one of the reasons why, you know, people will trust his company with their homes. In fact, I think he just, I think it was either 2019 or 2020, he got the local business of the year down in Albany. Okay, so he, he's obviously doing something right. Problem is, uh, back in 2018, he had an employee who um, he hired, wasn't the best employee, you know, he, he, he would show up late, you know, he would, uh, our, our client would send uh, workers to his house to pick him up and he wouldn't be ready, or, you know, and so, and so he's, a lot of times he'd started trying to skip out on work and he tried to skip out on the Bible study requirement too, although he never quite said it. Finally, you know, it, things kind of came to a head and, um, you know, he, he asked to be let out of Bible study. You know, this guy was already trying to seek special privileges. Our, our client said no. And basically our, the uh, other, his employee said, well, I'll see you in court. And so now, you know, we've been in court since 2018. Uh, his trial was actually supposed to be in August of last year. Um, it's been postponed twice. It's now scheduled for June. But basically, we're, we're there, we're fighting for his right to conduct, to run his business in accordance with biblical principles. Yeah, it's interesting, Ray, about this because, um, and we talk about this in our training video, Face in the Workplace, on how business owners can live their faith through their company, is uh, the case law is actually out of Washington State, and there was a case similar to this. And an employee did not want to be in the Bible study, and instead of talking to the, the employer and explaining about their religious, it didn't, you know, beliefs were different and they wanted accommodation and 
under Title VII be accommodated because of their faith. Uh, they just quit, and the court held, look, um, you, you didn't let them know about your religious objections. Uh, you just quit. And business owners are free to have to live their faith robustly in their business so long as they respect the religious beliefs of their employees. And this case wasn't a, a case where the gut gentleman said, hey, I have serious religious convictions. I did different than this, da, 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 da. Please accommodate my faith. It was more of a, just a belligerent, I don't want to attend. I don't want to participate. And um, so that's a, a clear distinction in this case. And anyway, we're defending, he's not only being sued, his company's being sued, but also he, he personally is being sued, his personal capacity, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Ray is representing him in that capacity. Mm -hmm. So that's a good case. Another one about the, I'd like to mention was uh, the, uh, the church parish. I didn't mention this one this, on Sunday, but the, the, the pastor who wants to be, uh, st uh, live in a, at the church, administer to people. Mm -hmm. um, what's going on with that the case? The Parsonage case. The Parsonage case. Yeah. yeah. Right. This is, well, this is a church down in Douglas County in a rural town called Umpqua, a small farming town. Uh, and this church actually predates Oregon statehood. It's been around since 1855. Uh, and so, you know, th this pastor, he feels called to live in the community that he serves. Problem is the um, Umpqua area doesn't have a lot of available housing. So, you know, he basically tried to arrange, he, he made, he applied to the Douglas County and asked, you know, can I convert one room in our church into a parsonage for myself and my wife? The county approved it. Problem is they have next door neighbors who are very hostile to churches and Christianity and whatever else. They won't come out and say it, but that's, you know, just for whatever reason, they don't like him or, and so they opposed it. They appealed to the Oregon Land Use Board of Appeals or LUBA. LUBA overturned it. And so we fought it up the chain to the um, Oregon Supreme Court. They wouldn't hear us. Uh, you know, the uh, Court of Appeals affirmed without opinion, which basically is their way of saying get lost. And so now we're in federal court. We've, uh, we've sued them. Uh, we sued the Oregon Land Use Board of Appeals. We've survived one motion to dismiss. And even though they're technically not supposed to file a second one, um, they have. And, we're, and now we're fighting that. They filed a second what? Motion to dismiss. Okay, second motion to dismiss. Okay. Uh, and my thinking is they're scared. They don't want this to go to trial. They, they know that if, uh, well, one of the things is with our LUPA, I don't want to get too technical here. Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. Yes, Defense thank you. Churches, religious freedom, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, state governments are not allowed to put a substantial burden on the free exercise of religion. Uh, and that's what they have done here. They are not, unless there's a compelling interest. And there is no compelling interest here. They're supposed to treat churches on equal terms with other similarly situated land uses. They have not done that. They know they are going to lose. They, are no, they're, they know they are going to lose face. I have a feeling this case, you know, based on a lot of the technical stuff that's involved, will probably reach the Supreme Court. I have, that's just a gut feeling I have. I'm hoping that it doesn't. But basically, we're fighting in... Uh, you know, we, we won't stop fighting. This is a tiny little church out in the middle of, you know, rural farmland. But we care about those people. We care about them. And without places like Pacific Justice Institute, you know, they, they have like 20 parishioners. You know, they don't have a, a deep well of funds. Uh, the pastor himself, you know, he has a second job. He's bivocational. Uh, he, he doesn't have, uh, he's not rolling in dough. So, we give them access to the justice system that they would not otherwise have. Right. You know, I'm glad you made that point because uh, we at Pacific Justice, we don't have like a private law firm on the side that we tell people, because um, I've seen this done before, where they say, oh, your church is how big? You have how much? Your budget's how much? Whoa, well, that's really for our for-profit firm. And they just, you know, we don't do a bait and switch. We never do that, ever. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't cherry pick just the high-profile cases that the marketing company says is going to be a good case or is going to be a high profile case. We make sure everyone gets help. And we also, we never charge a, a, a church an insurance. Um, I know another entity that does that, they'll say, we'll defend you, but based on your number of members, you have to pay us this much per month as an insurance. We don't do that. Um, so it's, it's really, I, 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 I'm biased obviously, but I really just, I just love the fact that we get so many calls and, and messages and emails from people that we've helped some of whom I'm not even aware of. I mean, because race already helped them and taken it on. 
uh, but it's, it's so encouraging. Mm -hmm. And uh, this state is keeping us very busy. What about that, uh, that church that had the education wing? This okay. is... This is unbelievable. Okay. okay. Well, we that church act is actually here in Clackamas County. It's over, here, it's over in Milwaukee. Uh, this, it's Faith on Hill Church, in case any of you have ever heard of it. Uh, but basically, they have this education wing. It's devoted to educational purposes. And they've opened it up to a homeschool co-op called Scopos Christian School. Now, basically, uh, they, they have what's called a conditional use permit that's... It's, Basically, the county has granted them permission to use their educational wing for educational purposes. Well, now the county's coming in and saying, well, even though it's education, we didn't intend for you to have a school there. And so, you know, so now we're basically fighting with, uh, uh, you know, Clackamas County uh, over and asking the court for what's called declaratory relief, it's, which is basically the court's way of saying that this permit you gave them allows them to do this. Yeah, and then, and then the other defense we have is the Religious Land Use and Neutralized Persons Act. Mm -hmm. And what that was, which, uh, was enacted is uh, it's really strong because it basically says, government, you can't inhibit a church from being somewhere or expanding or using their facility how they want to use it um, unless you can show a compelling state interest and that what you're requiring is the most least restrictive thing you could re require of that church it's the highest level of scrutiny under the Constitution, and uh, it's, it's very strong. We've used it over and over and over again for churches, mm -hmm. large and small. And we have had a, even had a major Ninth Circuit victory mm -hmm. on the matter a number of years ago that we've used, and uh, we've been building on. And this case is one that will probably possibly be having, using that precedent as we move forward. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah. Um, yeah, it was a, well, like, from the south, uh, the good news is it sounds like we may be close to a settlement there. We may, uh, I think the county is, to the county's credit, uh, they, they've actually been trying to find a way, you know, because I think they understand that the church doesn't have a lot of money at its disposal. Uh, you know, the permitting process to, to get a change of use is way expensive. I think we may be coming up with a way that, you know, that, that they can do this without having to go to trial. So it's, but... Actually, that's a good thing. No, because it's all about suing. <laughs> I want to sue. Oh, what I meant to say. No, go ahead. I'm it, sorry. It, it, is, it is a good thing because, you know, the, the trials can be uh, hectic, costly. Trials can be expensive. Trials may not necessarily go our way. But, you know, if we can resolve things without going to trial, that's always a wonderful thing. Right. It is. In fact, uh, over 90% of our case matters, we get resolved without litigation at all. Um, and it's, which is great because our goal is to help our, our clients, especially churches. How many churches want a big lawsuit? It's like, we want to reach out to this community with love, but we're going to sue this one and this, and we're going we're to fight the city. So we try to quickly get things resolved. Uh, our goal is to, that's our objective. Um, it's, it's sort of counter to your t traditional law firm because traditional law firm is one that they, they make their money when there's conflict. That's one of the problems in our system is a, and inherently, you know, that's just how it works. So um, anyway, so that's a great, that's what he's doing on, on that Ed case. Uh, there was another case you were working on as mm -hmm. well. I wanted you to share, um, help me here. Is there- uh, uh, Which case are you referring you to? Just make up one, I'm fine. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, uh, uh, well- uh, you, you talked about it yesterday, last night. Okay, well, th there is another, uh, there's actually an organization here in Beaver Creek uh, called Northwest Bible Training Center. Uh, basically, what they they're uh, a drug rehab facility, you know, but they use uh, you know Christian principles to kind of help people get clean and get free. Uh, and basically, you know, they were initially situated up in Portland, uh, but the problem is, you know, they had like a bar across the street and a marijuana dispensary open up next door. And well, as you can under as you might imagine, that's you know. It's kind of hard to break people free when temptation is on your doorstep. And so they chose to come out, you know, way the heck out there, you know, in, in kind of the more rural part of Beaver Creek, uh, because to get away from that temptation, uh, they're fleeing temptation, it's a good thing. Problem is, they, um, they don't, you know, first of all, the county thinks of them as a church. They're not really a church. You know, it, it, you're not gonna see their parking lot full on Sundays. Uh, they don't really fit neatly in any of the categories that um, 
the county grants permits for. And so, so they've kind of run, it, run into some problems there, uh, also some problems with some permits that the previous owners of the property didn't get. And so now basically, you know, they, they kind of have to get approved to just be where they're at and do what they're doing. And, you know, we're, and basically we've, we've, we've butted heads with the county a little bit, but the county seems to be at least, okay, now they're at least willing to work with us. Yeah. I know a church in, uh, it was in Dixon, California. They were uh, wanting to get a, the permit to occupy this, this building in downtown Dixon. And they were initially told no. And the planning commissioner, one of the planning commissioners on the commission, I'll never forget this, because I was there, says, I just don't think that these kind of people are going to shop in our shops and eat in our restaurants. As an attorney, I'm like going, oh, thank you. <laughs> so then I, get, I attended the next planning commission <laughs> meeting representing the church. And I said, uh, I said uh, first off, I would like to thank this planning commission for your openness and transparency. Uh, and, and in fact, the, the, the fact that this is on videotape and on the record, everything you say, I, can just, I want you to know as an attorney how much I appreciate that transparency. It, it is so helpful in times like this. And then I, I mean, as I'm saying that, what I'm really saying is, think about what you said the last meeting. And the lady who said this, the planning commissioner, she said it came time for her to talk. She says, yeah, um, I've really been thinking about this and I see no reason why we shouldn't welcome this church into our town. And I think this would be a great thing. And um, one of the things, the arguments they gave against the church, they said, uh, it was a uh, Calvary Chapel, I remember now. Mm -hmm. they, said, uh, they said, well, you know, right across the street from your church is this, is this bar. And um, I mean, you know, it sounds like this wouldn't be a good, a good fit to have something like that right across from your church. And the church said, oh, well, quite the contrary. Uh, we're delighted that they're right across from our church. We're looking forward to our relationship with, with, with that institution. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, because it, it was like, yes, um, you know, occupy, you know, where does Satan go for vacation? Boom, I want to give him a terrible vacation. Let's go there. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, when you've got a ministry that is dealing with people with a, a particular witness and a, a temptation, mm -hmm. then it can be really problematic. There was a uh, pro-life clinics in California that were required not that long ago. Remember this, Ray? Yeah. They were ordered in their waiting room, this is a pro-life clinic, to have a large sign saying where women can get a free or low cost abortion and the number to call. Yeah, that's like telling AA they have to have a big sign saying where they can get free booze, right? And the number to call delivered to your door, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like, what? That's crazy. And we were the first to step up to file that lawsuit to challenge it. Others followed suit. They mm -hmm. all went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court uh, said, this is unconstitutional. You can't tell a ministry that they have to advertise something that goes against what they believe. That's, so uh, there's some great case law that we've been able to f participate in. Uh, that I think is, mm -hmm. is going to be real helpful. And it's funny that you should mention that that church, you know, set up shop next to a bar because there's actually two cases that it reminded me of that uh, I'd love to talk about. One of them's here in Oregon. Uh, it involves uh, the, the little town of Drain, which is a little, just a little ways off I-5. Yeah, population 1,200, uh, roughly. Uh, yeah, basically they have a strip club that literally just opened next to a church. There's 25 feet separating oh, them. Oh, yeah. 25 time. feet. Okay. And uh, so basically I got word about this way back in June. So immediately, you know, I, I, one of the things I did when I was an intern is I, you know, I did research into that. And basically I found out that you know, there's, there is a compelling interest in keeping places like that far away from places where children congregate, which include churches. 25 feet is not very far. So um, basically, I just dashed off a letter to the city council saying, you know, you, you can find a way to keep this church away from that, or, or excuse me, keep the strip club away from the church. Uh, and within, by August 1st, they had uh, enacted an ordinance keeping them away. Uh, so right now, they're, sadly, the strip club is still there, but um, you know the church is kind of seizing it as an opportunity to witness to um, the mostly men who um, patronize that establishment. Yeah. Uh, it, and you know, on top of that, uh, you know, if heaven forbid, you know, it, 
litigate, it comes to litigation, guess what? We'll be there. We, we will intervene on the church's behalf and say, guess what? This place is a danger to the children. And another case, and, and this is where Brad gave me the nickname Bulldog, by the way. This case involved San, the city of San Francisco, okay? Not exactly the most welcoming place for Christians. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, think it's Portland's big sister. Uh, <laughs> so basically, we've got a, a church and a preschool in a largely, in a community mostly made up of Chinese immigrants. These are people who, you know, their English is very, very limited. They don't really know how to express themselves. Nobody, see, nobody will seem to listen to them except us. Okay, they turn to us. And so we go in, we advocate on their behalf and basically say, you know, look, this is an adult business or this is an adult oriented business establishment, not much different from a strip club or an adult bookstore or a bar or a liquor store. They're both within 500 feet. You know, I think the law in San Francisco required 600 feet. Marijuana dispensary? This is the marijuana okay, dispensary yes, case. Ahead. Yeah, a, mar a medical mar a pot shop wanted to set up sh right very close to the, these two establishments. We walked into San Francisco. There, there's thousands of people at this meeting on, on both sides. And I'll, I'll be blunt, the San Francisco uh, Board, of, um, Board of Commissioners hates us. They do not like us at all. So, For some reason. <laughs> So basically, I go in, I'm arguing on their behalf, I'm, I'm getting boos, I'm getting hisses. Yeah. Um, and basically, I argue our case. At the end of the night, basically, I'm getting reamed, you know, bas basically, the, the commissioners each, are each taking a turn blasting us. But yet, what happens? They voted nine to two in our favor. The pot shop is not there. Yeah, it was, it was this was an incredible God thing, because they were vicious, they were attacking us, and you're just like, there's no way we're going to win this. And, and yet, and he, and he stood his ground. They're screaming at him, booing him. Just, and he's just like, that's what I say, the bulldog. That's where like, he got that reputation right from that point. I thought, I don't know if I could have with, dealt with that. They're just like screaming and yelling and mean and viciousness and hate. And then, but in the end, God is the final authority. You know, if God can speak to a donkey, <laughs> he can speak to the Ninth Circuit. He can speak to the planning, you know, San Francisco Commission and... And so, um, so it was, it was actually, it was really incredible. We saw another miraculous decision, very similar to this, dealing with homeschoolers uh, in California. They were, uh, was, we knew it was gonna happen eventually. It was sort of like, um, you know, like a, a war that, you know, both sides don't acknowledge the other kind of thing, and you're gonna eventually have a conflict, and you're not sure where the first shot's gonna be fired, uh, dealing with the rights of homeschooling in California, because it was one of the worst states to homeschool in because the state superintendent of public instruction says it's illegal. The attorney general said it's illegal. Well, the prior attorney general said it was illegal and protected. So this is just this split. And the teachers union says it's illegal to homeschool. Well, it comes out of an appellate court. And I don't know if you remember this or not, but it was a number of years ago, the appellate court and uh, juvenile, out of juvenile court. And they said homeschooling is illegal. They voted three to zero. Unless you're a credentialed teacher, you cannot homeschool in California, period. We stepped in and we represented the homeschooling program that was being used. My friend Michael Ferris was uh, working, defending one of the parents. So we go in, we file a motion for them to rehear the case. Now, it's, you just don't see that happen. Mm -hmm. that's, like, that's three men with black robes sitting up high, possibly having to admit that they were wrong, okay? Remember mm -hmm. that happy days, okay, guys, okay, episode, okay. So they, um, they allow us to, re to rehear the case. Right? So we, we go in, we argue the case. I'm thinking, awesome. I call Kevin Snyder, our chief counsel who argued it. He goes, he goes Brad, he goes, we lost. I go, well, wait a minute. I mean, because he never said we just lost. He may say, well, it didn't go well, it doesn't look. He says, we lost. We need to stop prepping for the appeal to the state Supreme Court. I said, really? I says, yes, it's clear. They were all three just vicious towards us and so people told me they said you know how to go i says um, unless god intervenes we lost the only way we're going to win this is if there's an intervention from god because they are resolutely against us and so homeschoolers we put it out they were praying people were pray praying christians were praying and then they came down with their decision three to zero reversing themselves I've never seen this ever in my lifetime 
reversed mm -hmm. themselves and they said, homeschooling is legal in California without being a credential teacher. And it was unbelievable. The other side appeals it. State Supreme Court didn't take it up. California went from being one of the most riskiest places to homeschool to one of the safest places to homeschool. But now they have social workers being picking up there, being more aggressive and mm -hmm. things like that. But um, by the way, social workers, that's another area that we, we get involved in. Mm -hmm. Oregon is one of the worst in the country. Oregon, Washington State, California, I think Illinois, New York, some of the worst in the country. Um, and you've, you've heard of those situations as, I, as well, mm -hmm. where they come threaten to take kids. And that's my expertise. Uh, so they often end up being sent to me because I give emergency counsel to parents uh, who have to deal with social workers threatening to take their kids because of some anonymous complaint. Mm -hmm. So uh, that keeps us real busy. Yeah, we've actually got, yeah, I've gotten calls like that too. You know, we actually had uh, one individual who had to ultimately made the decision to, uh, because his uh, daughter was um, c kind of having feelings like she wanted to be a boy. And basically, unfortunately, uh, state law requires that uh, any counselors basically respect that, that counsel accordingly. And, you know, the father didn't want that, so they wound up taking their child to Tennessee. Yeah, so and that's in California we had the same thing. The parents called me before the social worker came. Actually, it was a pastor and his wife and uh, called and said, uh, what do we do? Your daughter was like 13, yeah, 13, mm -hmm. and she wanted to be a boy. And, uh, and so I said, well, what are you gonna tell the social worker tomorrow? And the pastor said, well, we're gonna explain to her that we're Christians and that we believe what the Bible says is true, and we're going to uh, raise, and that we, this is how we raise our child, and we're gonna have our child get Christian counseling and Christian instruction, and that, uh, so that she can be set free from this, these feelings and things, and da 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 da. And I said, okay, um, you're going to lose your ch child tomorrow if you say that. Here's what you're going to say. You're going to, you're going to thank the social worker for the work that they're doing and their commitment to help people like your daughter who are different and, and helping uh, encourage more tolerance in our society and, and, your, and, and sensitivity for people like your daughter. And you're so grateful and how you are always unconditional in your love for your daughter, no matter what she does or what chooses, that's the true part. Anyway, um, so the unconditional love part. Anyways, he says to me, well, wait a minute. That's, that's not what we believe. I said, oh, I know. I says, but when Pharaoh's people knocked on Moses' mom's door, and said, um, do you have any children? Any, any babies here we can kill? She didn't say, oh, you caught me. Okay, it's in a little basket. You'll see three reeds to the right in that little cove there. You'll find <laughs> the baby, go ahead and kill it. She didn't do that. Did Corey Ten Boom when they knocked on the door? She said, oh, yep, yeah, they're in a hiding place. I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that. No, why? Because it would be a much greater evil to play into that. And so instead you do what you can to shield that greater evil by protecting your daughter, and that's what they did. They protected their daughter. Their daughter then was then pulled from the public schools after that school semester was over, and then put into Christian training, put to a Christian school, and was able to be ministered to and helped constructively. And that kind of tactical training is what we have. With the Supreme Court we have now, mm -hmm. we may see some case law where the Supreme Court may say, oh no, that's a violation of parental rights. Let's talk about the Supreme Court that we have now. Mm -hmm. Um, originally, we had it was five to four uh, using the Jacobson, Jacobson rule after this thing, the pandemic happened, saying, which the Jacobson rule basically says, judges, in times of emergency and pandemics and things, um, you just give great deference to governments and governors and let them do what they want. As long as they just have some basis of an emergency, we, we just, we won't get involved in whether constitutional rights are being violated. It's an emergency. They can just, you know, it's the Jacobson rule. And then Amy Coney Barrett mm -hmm. was appointed just in time by God's providence because God knew the outcome of the election. That's all that's political I'm gonna get today. So anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, because of, it just worked out perfectly in this providence, we have Amy Coney Barrett. And then what happened when the Supreme Court re-examined that issue of churches? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll tell you this. Uh, when they handed down the ruling in the South Bay United Pentecostal case, I was fighting uh, um, Governor Brown uh, before our own Supreme Court. And so when, that, when the 
National Supreme Court gave down that horrendous decision in South Bay United. Uh, I knew it was going to affect us adversely. So, but you know, the fact is, we still have to fight on. Even though, you know, if you know, you know, imagine the Trailblazers going to the NBA Finals uh, against the Boston Celtics and the referees showing up in Celtics jerseys. That's kind of what we were facing. So, yeah. uh, but but you still show up. You still play. You still give it your best shot. And so now, uh, thankfully. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court has come to its senses, uh, and there was this very brilliant uh, decision, like just that was handed down, I believe, just yesterday. And and uh, Justice Gorsuch wrote it, and you know he talks about you know how you know state governments kind of keep moving the goalposts on this pandemic thing, you know, and you know restoration of liberty is always just around the corner. And basically, they said no more. It's been long enough. They need to have their. It's time to restore their religious rights. Yeah, uh, and they never should have taken them away to begin with. Pretty much is what the implication was. Yeah, and and it was which was great was also the courts made it really clear now in two decisions that they just re recent decisions that you cannot put ever put the Constitution on the shelf. Amen. That the government is always held under scrutiny, mm -hmm. pandemic or no pandemic, floods, earthquakes, whatever, they are always under scrutiny. To, to prove up their case that it's truly compelling state interest and what they're doing is the most least restrictive means of furthering that interest. There is no just great deference. And I think the Jacobson rule is effectively dead. Mm -hmm. And I'm delightful for that. Um, even Roberts has, has come to his senses and he's, he's a follower, he's not really a, a leader. He, he's the weakest chief justice, I think, we've had in 100 years, you know. Mm. So, but he now, we have a strong five judges on there. He's come back around, so we, now we have six. So I'm mm. optimistic looking forward that um, I think we have a big light at the end of this tunnel with this new Supreme Court. Let me give you a hypothetical, Ray. Let's say mm. that Ginsburg did not pass away and that, um, and that uh, President Trump did not make a replacement and that she was still on the court would there still be this big light at the end of the tunnel uh, with the, the Jacobson rule staying in, in, in active law? Uh, governors can still do what they want. I, I, don't, I don't think it would be, I think it'd be a very different situation, especially since we couldn't expect the Supreme Court to, to be replaced with good justices. Yeah, I, I would certainly be less optimistic, uh, you know, because, well, uh, Justice John Roberts, I, I would go so far as to say he's no longer in the conservative camp. He's, uh, it, it seems like he's switched sides. Um, but it's, so I'd certainly be less optimistic. Yeah, at least I, I saw, I, he's wishy washy. Even like, the, was it Obamacare, I think it was, or what he, he ruled on where? Yeah. Yeah, where, get this, he was on the other side saying this is unconstitutional with the details of the case. Up until the very, very, very end, he suddenly switches. We're talking like days. In fact, it was so much at the end that in the dissenting opinion, they forgot to change it because it implied that he was still on their side. I mean, it was that, it was that far to the very end, very, very, very ending. He was just switched and it was an emotion thing and as mm -hmm. opposed to a, a constitutional mm -hmm. justice thing. It was a feelings thing. And um, which can be very, very dangerous. Feelings are very dangerous. Right, and unfortunately, and unfortunately, sometimes judges rule based on their feelings, not based on the law. It's one of the biggest frustrations that we have to deal with as attorneys. Um, something else I want to let you know about is um, the, uh, it's, it's a fantastic video series. The guy who hosts it is incredible. It's awesome. It's, it's called The Dacus Connection. Okay, it's my, it's my show, okay. Uh, it's a five-part series. And in there we talk about, it's, I'm sitting in the middle of a road, so uh, I'm on one side sitting on a red stool, and then we have the dotted yellow line, and then the, and then the other person is on the other side on a, on a blue stool. A little bit of symbolism there, sort of, maybe, okay. And, um, and all these people I'm interviewing are people who see the world differently. Um, and one of them is a believer. Um, he is a, a brother in Christ, but he is a different uh, a political and racial background and different perspective. Um, and I put that on because I think there's a need for the church to, to realize, to be open and be able to communicate with love and respect as opposed to just being silent and saying, hi brother, hi brother. 
you know, and, and really not being, being more real. And how, and how do you relate, and how can you be real but yet but not be offensive? Where do we find it, uh, David's connection? Thank you very much for asking that question. Where do we find it? For just $99, you can get, no, I'm just teasing. Um, it's all, everything we do is free. So if anyone's selling something from PJI, they're, they're not from PJI. Um, right on our website, we, re we released the first one, and that's that, that pastor, and he's had me speak at his church twice, by the way. So um, even though we see things a little differently from our angle, um, he preaches the word, and he's a Bible-believing Bible preacher, and he let me preach his church twice. And even though everyone in his church probably didn't vote the way I did, um, it's, it's exciting, though, that how we can come together as Christians and, um, and still cling to the word and, and preach from the word and, and agree with the word. So, uh, but the other people on the other series, parts of the series, there's three, three more after that, uh, they're all non-believers. Um, and, and they're all people that I have prior relationships with. One of them is the most renowned atheist in America today, Michael Newdow. I got to know him when we were litigating, and afterwards it was defending the Pledge of Allegiance and God We Trust on, on our, um, or excuse me, on our currency. You know, mm -hmm. and, and he was on the other side. I come up to him afterwards. I said, Michael. He goes, yes, you know, body language. And I says, hey, I, um, obviously I, I see differently the case differently than you do, but I just want to congratulate you on just what an excellent job you did in oral argument. I says, I, in fact, I don't know attorney that I think could have argued your case as well as you did. You did an excellent job. Well, thank you. And I said, in fact, someday if you change your perspective on the Establishment Clause, I'd love to have someone with your skill set working for Pacific Justice. He goes, well, maybe we could find some common points of connection. And our relationship started. He later allowed us to intervene on another case, um, which was a miracle. Because <laughs> the U.S. Department of Justice didn't file the objection in time, and God just opened the doors for us to step right on in, and um, so, and then so so he's on the case. So we, I'm interviewing him, and then okay, we're ready, done, wrap up. And then, um, and then <laughs> I'm very sensitive to body language from a host because I don't know when we're supposed to end, but I can see we're about. To, see, uh, the, the other one we have is with a, um, a leader, Muslim leader, of the, all the Muslim mosques in California. I met him at a school board meeting, standing up on the same, against the, you know, for the same thing, and um, against wickedness. And then the third one is a transgender activist. He's the leader in California. So these are small potatoes. And I met him after he demonstrated in front of my office. Holy Spirit put on my heart to connect with him. I'm incompetent. I'm a terrible at arranging things. So God took care of that for me. Less than two weeks later, I'm sitting next to him by God's providence on a TV studio, uh, One America News in San Diego. And I told him, mm -hmm. it was like halfway through, I said, I said, is it possible? This may sound strange, but is it possible we get together afterwards? I'd really like to visit and just understand where you, where you came from, how you got to where you are. It really helped me grow as a person to understand that. Would you do that for me? Sure. We met for over three and a half hours. He talked 98% of the time. And at the end he said, you know, Brad, you're really different than what I thought. And I said, you mean I'm not the cold-hearted, hate-filled, right-wing extremist, fundamentalist, bigot? That's exactly what he said. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, you're really different. I said, well, thank you. You're different, too. This is great. And I met with him again and again. The Holy Spirit did something, is working. And, um, and it's exciting. So we're, the Dacus Connection is something to, to give to the body of Christ to show how we can connect with someone, respectfully disagree, not compromise truth, but at the same time connect and show love and respect at the same time. And, um, and so we're releasing that, and the final one is a grand one we put together by God's providence. So anyway, I'll, I'll go ahead and relinquish it. And if we can help you guys at any time, anyone you know, contact us. Uh, we'd love to serve you in any way we can. And, uh, and I want to thank those of you who are supporting our uh, PGI and our office here, because that is how we're able to keep him here doing all the work that he's doing. So God and, bless you. And, if you. and if any of you hear of any cases uh, or any uh, things that are happening here in Oregon that you think that we, you might need our, by all means, Refer them to me. I'll be happy to hear them out and see what we can do. Yeah, very good. Thank you.